Hi, in this tutorial I will show you my way how to create a realistic looking studio lighting setup in V-Ray to test and develop your shaders or use for product rendering. I will also show you tricks how to optimize your render time so that you can reach beautiful and presentable results faster than ever before. This tutorial will serve as a base for many of my upcoming shading tutorials, so be sure to subscribe to this channel to not miss out on any of those. So first I show you the wrong way and I'm sure many of you guys encountered this kind of situation before. You want to create or test out a cool looking shader, so you're opening your 3D software and you are greeted with a totally empty scene. For a lack of a better model, you decide to create a standard teapot and take it from there. You try to render and everything is black, so you decide to brighten up the environment and now something starts to appear at least. You start working on your shader and find so far everything looks boring, so you decide to add some extra light in the ground plane. You then decide to use some HDRI instead to make it look more realistic, but you still end up with a pretty horrible looking scene that is neither optimized nor presentable to anyone. Any additional work you would put into your shaders is totally wasted because your base scene is very poorly set up and you would first need to invest much more time and effort in your scene before any of your work of your shaders would pay off. So now I will show you my preferred way. You open your software and instead of an empty scene, you are welcomed by an already fully set up multi-purpose studio lighting scene with an interesting model to try out your shading. When you press render, you can move the camera in all angles and will always get a nice, clean and presentable representation of your shader. You can then start with the actual shading right away and are not hold back by first having to set up an appropriate scene. You can also then fastly try out a huge variation of pre-built materials, for example from libraries, to see if they are working for your specific use case. This way you can focus your time on the part that matters most instead of always having to start from zero again. In this tutorial I will show you how you build up this studio lighting scene from scratch so that you can build something similar for yourself. Alright, so now we're here in a totally empty 3ds Max scene. The only thing that I did so far was to rearrange those panels a little bit. So we have now two perspective views here. One with a film gate that you can get by pressing Shift F. So Shift F, you can toggle between the film gate and the original view. And this one just follows whatever resolution you set up in here. So here you set up a square resolution. So this view now gives me an accurate representation of whatever I will be rendering in the end. Then have another perspective view here to navigate the scene. And I have two orthographic views, one top view and one front view in here. Another thing that I would recommend to use is the scene explorer, which you can get, which you can get by pressing this button here. And then this panel will appear here on the left side normally, where you can see all the different layers that are set up in your scene and you can much better organize your scene. So at the moment, there's just this one default layer with nothing inside, but later on you will be able to group your different elements in the scene in different layers and it's much better and easier to navigate through the scene. You will see that the renderer at the moment is set to scanline and I did this in order to reset the settings in V-Ray. So if I now switch back to V-Ray, I will make sure that all the default settings will be loaded into V-Ray. Then I will choose the view that I want to render. So in my case, it is this view here, the one in the left upper corner, and I will lock it to this view. So that not accidentally it will render some different view. Then if I go here to customize preferences and I go in this gamma and LUT tab, just make sure that those settings are set up exactly like this way. I will later on in a other tutorial explain why those settings should be like this way, but it's a very big topic and uh, for following this tutorial, just make sure that those settings are set up accordingly. So a gamma of 2.2, and then to affect your color selectors and to affect your material editor. So Chaos Group recommends the use of the default settings for pretty much all use cases. I will make some very small adjustments to them and I'll explain you why. First of all, here in this V-Ray tab, I will switch the rendering type from progressive to bucket. So this way, once I do my final rendering, it will be rendered in buckets instead of a progressively redefining picture, which I already get once I initiate the IPR. Then here in this GI tab, it is set up for the primary engine is set up to brute force and the secondary engine is set to light cache. This way it's very well set up for your final rendering. However, the light cache requires a pre-pass to be calculated. So this way, once you do lots of small changes in your scene, it always needs to recalculate a pre-pass before you can see an accurate representation of the changes that you did. So while you're building up the scene, normally I switch it to brute force. This way the GI will be 
more noisy and calculate slower, but you will see an instant feedback. So while you're doing your scene, while you're preparing your scene, I recommend to use those settings here. And then once you do your final rendering and you want to have optimized GI calculation, you switch the secondary engine back to light cache. And this way you will make sure that your GI renders as smooth as possible and will be also calculated as fast as possible. But since now we're still in the setup phase of our scene, let's switch it back to brute force. And then let's head on to our render elements. So inside here you can add certain render elements that you might need to recompose your picture and post or that are very handy in order to evaluate what's happening in all the different channels of your uh, rendering. So you can see for example what's happening in the lighting or what's happening in the GI or in the reflection and so on. So you could go through here and add all the required render elements but in order to make it simpler I just created a preset that you can find in the description below. And then you just go in here, load this preset. And then from my view, all of the important render elements are added. So you have lighting, GI, specular, reflection, refraction, self-illumination, then those two handy parses, which are diffuse and the normal parse. And then I have a denoiser in here that by default is not enabled, but you can very easily enable it in here. All right, so that's basically all the changes that I did to the default V-Ray settings. I now merge some elements into my scene, which are not part of this tutorial, but I will make sure that we go briefly through it and I explain you exactly what you need to know. So it is not a modeling tutorial. That's why I won't cover all the basics of modeling. There's probably lots of other nice tutorials about this out there. So I would recommend to check out those if you don't really know how you could create this kind of geometry. But let's now walk through everything so that you are clear about what is now in our scene. So I think the easiest way is to first hide everything. And then we just unhide the first layer and go through everything one by one. So we'll first focus about this object right here. All right, so this object I modeled by hand and it has certain kind of properties that I would like to introduce. So first of all, it's a combination of round surfaces and more flat surfaces. So that's important because the highlights on the flat surfaces, they look different than they would look lot like on the more rounded surfaces. So I just try to bring both type of surfaces inside. Then it has thicker parts here and thinner parts here, for example, so that if you use shaders that use um, subsurface scattering, for example, you can see how deep the light is scattering inside the object. The same way, for example, if you're using a refractive material, like all of those parts here are properly modeled out so that uh, it's not intersecting with the geometry here. And then also, if I just make this transparent, you can see there's some additional geometry inside here. So that, for example, if you use a glass material, you have more thick glass parts here and more thin glass parts here. So this way you will just get a more interesting uh, looking refractive material. And then also I have uh, put in the effort to unwrap everything. So if you check the UV editor here, you can see that everything is appropriately un unwrapped so that if I use textures, um, yeah, I'm not bound to only be able to use triplanar projection, but I can just use this standard UVs in here. And then everything is turbo smooth uh, in the viewport a little bit and while rendering quite a lot to have to make sure that everything is really, really smooth. All right, so that's for this part here. And then the next part would be the floor. So the floor is quite simple. It's just a circular geometry with the texture applied to it. And the only thing that is worth mentioning basically is if I open the shader, um, you can see here that so it just uses a texture and a little bit of reflection and a little bit of glossiness but the only important thing here is that i use some opacity here so if i if i choose this map here it's a gradient ramp a circular or radial gradial ramp which looks like this and that means all the white parts they are fully opaque and all the black parts are fully transparent and you see that there's like a small variation here in the in the transparency with a little bit of noise applied to it. So this way I don't get a very harsh edge on the floor, on the border of the floor and it will integrate much better into my environment. So that's just like a creative choice that I made but you don't really need to follow this but for me I prefer it like this way. 
The last thing that you need to know is if you use these kind of gradient opacity maps, it's much better to switch this opacity mode here to normal because by default it sets to stochastic, which renders fast, but in case of these very gradient opacity maps, it might give you some unexpected results. So I just switched this one here to normal. Then if I unhide this layer here, there's two spheres inside with two different materials. So the one here on the left has like a gray material applied to it with a very blurry reflection. And then this one here has a chrome material applied to it uh, that just gives me 100% reflection of my environment. So the reason that I have that is that on this sphere here, you can always see the light direction. So you always know from which direction your main lights are coming from. And then this sphere here is that it always shows your, your environment. No matter what kind of shader you have applied to here, you can always in these two spheres read what your lighting and what your environment looks like. And then if I unhide this layer here, there's just a controlling object here that just allows me to rotate all the geometry or to move all the geometry that's here in my shading ball layer. And then in this layer here, it's just a camera so that if accidentally I move the view in here and I want to go back later on, I will always be able to do that once I uh, just select this camera here and then I can switch back to my perspective view and everything is basically reset. Okay, so now that you know everything that's part of the scene, we can start to build on the lighting from scratch. So before we can start working on the lighting itself, we would first need to find some high quality HDRI. And I'm planning to make a tutorial about HDRIs in general, but this website here can really recommend to download some really high quality HDRIs. And it's called hdrihaven.com, where you can find high resolution, totally unclipped, 100% free HDRIs that you can download right away without even registering on this website. So if you like their content, I would suggest to become a patron of their website because then you can see this website even grow further. So um, here I chose, if you go to this indoor category, then this one here, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Libombo, uh, this HDRI here, and you can download it in different kind of resolutions. And then I will show you in Photoshop what kind of adjustments I apply to it. All right, so this one here is the HDI that I downloaded from the website and I just added this exposure adjustment here on top. And if I now like choose a lower exposure, you can really see the nice information that's stored in this HDRI. And this one, even if I remember correctly, had only seven or nine exposure values, but they have HDRIs on their website which, up to, which have up to 30 stops of exposure saved inside. So that's really, really high quality HDRIs and can really recommend to use them. So I made some small adjustments to this HDRI and I will show you this one here. So basically the only thing that I did was to desaturate those kind of very yellowish colors here on the wall because I want to create some more like neutral studio lighting setup because otherwise everything would get too warm. So once you finish your adjustments, you should just double check if you add exposure adjustments here on top that your exposure values here in the HDRI are still intact because some adjustments would potentially destroy your HDRI information in here, right? So after you finished or while you're doing it, just always double check that you're not like uh, deleting information that you later on need for your lighting. So let's just switch this one here back to zero again. And this picture I will also upload and link in the description below so you can use exactly the same kind of picture that I was using. So now that we have our HDRI prepared, we have to add it into our scene. So this in V-Ray works with the use of the V-Ray bitmap node. And this one in earlier versions was called V-Ray HDRI in case you're wondering. So then you just in here open the map that we just created and then choose a different mapping type. At the moment it's set to 3S Max Standard, but since it's a spherical map, we have to set the mapping type back to spherical. And then we get access to those kind of values here, horizontal rotation and vertical rotation. We can choose a different rotation basically. And there's a bunch of options down here available as well, which might become more important later on. But for now, let's leave everything by default and let's just rename the map to environment. 
So now let's start the rendering and we will first see nothing because our HDI doesn't really affect our scene yet. So totally black, you can see something is happening in the alpha channel. But now we want to use this HDI to light the scene. So there's two ways how to do that and one is good and one is bad. So let me first show you the bad one, which is to use the environment. So you go here to rendering environment and this tab here opens and then you just drag in your HDI into the environment. And now you can see it is affecting now our picture or our scene. But the problem is that it has certain kind of disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages is that everything will become much more noisy than the other preferred way that I will show you in a second. So if you see here the floor, it takes really, really long time until this noise here cleans up. And the reason for that is that it doesn't really use a very optimized way to calculate this. And the other problem is that our channels are not how they should be. So if I now go to my lighting channel, for example, everything is totally black and all the lighting contribution is composed now on this GI channel. And the same is true for the reflection. So for example, if I check my specular, it's totally black and then the, everything is here in the reflection channel. So that's the reason why you should normally not use this way to use it in the environment. So let's now remove this one here again. And now let's use the preferred way, which is the use of a V-Ray dome light. So if you have the V-Ray toolbar installed, you will find this option up here. Then let's add the V-Ray dome light. And instead of using this white color here, we will use our HDRI and drag it into the texture. And now you will see that everything looks very similar to how we had it before, but it has a certain kind of advantages. And one you can see right away is that this noise here cleans up much more fast compared to the one where we use it in the environment map. So you can see now it's already almost noise free. And the other advantage is that now our render passes are set up correctly. So I have something in my lighting, I have something in my GI, and the same is true for specular and reflection. So no passes are purely black anymore and everything is very good or very well set up for compositing. So the reason why everything renders much faster is something called important samplings. And let me just read that here from the V-Ray help in order to get it correct, is that V-Ray uses importance samplings to trace more rays in the directions where most of the light is coming from. This ensures speed and quality that were never before possible with pure gathering GI methods. So this option is hidden down here, which is called use MIS or multi-important sampling. And there's a reason why it's hidden is that because there's basically no way why, why, why it should be disabled. So you always leave this one on. And if you disable it, it will get really noisy and really ugly very fast. So don't touch this, but that's the reason why everything renders much faster with the V-Ray dome light instead of using it here in the environment. And that's also the reason why you should always use a V-Ray dome light compared to this option down here. All right, so now the only thing that we need to do is to rename our light to LGT environment, for example, and then let's move on. I will stop this rendering here, close this one here, and let's now check more in our scene. Okay, what I now like to do normally is to add a new layer and then just merge all the lights into this one layer. So let me call this one LGT and then sort it like this. And then all my lights will be basically in this layer and I can very easily hide and unhide them. So now if I have my light selected here, I will just add it to the original position of my scene, move it up a little bit, for example. And then there's a very handy option, which is this one here, lock texture to icon. And I will demonstrate what it does. So if we start now the rendering, and now I will choose to lock the texture to the icon. If I then rotate my HDRI, you will see that the HDI is basically really rotated and it's the same thing like if I would rotate those values here in the horizontal rotation. But in this way, it's much more easy and much more, uh, I would say, interactive to do it. So let's just switch it to this option here and then let's find a way or let's find a position where we like what we are getting. So for example, if I rotate this one here to minus 100 in this case, then I think for now I like the reflections that I'm getting here on the sphere and I can also see the reflection of my HDRI in here. All right, cool. So now up to the next step, which is following problem. So if I now move this view down here and I rotate around in my scene, I will see that um, yeah, we get our HDI showing through in the environment and that's maybe something that I don't really want for the scene because yeah, it doesn't really look very nice. So there's one option here that you can make this light here invisible. 
if you do that everything will stay the same but it won't show up in my environment anymore so with this option here i can hide it into my environment and then either what i choose here in the environment will show through for example i can now add a color in here and it wouldn't really affect anything from in terms of lighting and gi and so on or i think the better way is to just duplicate this light here and then i will call it lgt background and then i will link it to this light down here and now we will just use a blurred version of this environment map here so i will just duplicate this map and then i will call it uh, background and now i could either so first of all i prepared like a blurred version of this map here or an even easier way is to just use these blur offset values down here so if you see for example i make this one to 0.25 then the whole map will become really really blurred and that's exactly what i want in this case so now if i choose my light here this one for the environment i will pipe this bitmap into here or this V-Ray bitmap into here and then i will not use it to affect anything in my scene except that i will make it visible and this way it will be my, you can see there's something happening in the background when i rotate my camera right and now it is linked also to this light here so if i rotate this light here also my environment or my background will be moved accordingly and that's really just the power of v-ray that you can split up everything very efficient so that for example you have something different showing up in the environment but on your model you will use this for example this dome light to see uh, to see the reflections and to affect the lighting so that's something that i really like about v-ray that you're very flexible to split up everything the same way how we want to achieve all right so cool this one now is our setup for this one here let's now just switch back to our camera view and then back to our perspective and let's just close everything here and now let me open the render view again and let's first fine-tune the picture a little bit so let me move this one here to this side and then first of all i think it's a little bit dark at the moment so there's now two ways I can brighten it up. So one way would be to go to the material editor and to use a different multiplier here in the light or I can, or in the HDRI, or I can just set the multiplier in the light. So I would just add a multiplier of two here, for example, for the light. And I need to remember to do the same thing here for the environment as well. Because yeah, otherwise my environment would be darker than my main light and that's something that we don't want. So now if I navigate around, I will see i will get a nice representation of a scene but something that you might notice is that it looks very unrealistic at the moment and this we're gonna tackle now all right and what i mean by this is that for example if you check this ball here you get this really ugly transitions here happening on the ball where you have this really totally burned out part here the same is true for the background part here some really ugly color transitions here and so on here also you can see some really unrealistic colors and everything looks just not right and not very pleasing and not very realistic so there's a step that you need to implement and that is called tone mapping so the reason for that is that this picture that you're seeing here in the frame buffer that's a linear image so and there's nothing wrong about a linear image that's the way how it should be calculated and that's also the way how v-ray is calculating it but the problem is more that it doesn't really show correctly on your monitor so this is a very big and important topic it's called in general linear workflow and there i will plan to make a tutorial about this so once that's released now a link should appear somewhere on the screen and then you can check that out but for this tutorial now i will just very briefly touch this and explain you what you need to do in order to make it look correctly so the first important step is to compress the dynamic range of your picture so at the moment you see that you have values if you check this color picker down here you see you have values which are much brighter than one for example here even some values that are like 10 yeah like here for example and uh, first step would be to compress this range because our monitor can't really display these kind of super bright value so let's use this exposure node here or this exposure correction here and this you can also find in older versions of v-ray in your frame buffer just in this version 5 of v-ray the 
way it's composed, it's, it looks a little bit different, but in earlier versions of V-Ray, you can find exactly the same procedure. So here there's this highlight burn value and you can then lower this one here. And this one is basically compressing the dynamic range. And at the same time, you will see you're losing contrast, but those like extremely burned out parts and those kind of weirdish colors, they kind of start to disappear, right? So you can find something that looks pleasing to you, or if you want, you can also like totally uh, make the highlight burn to totally zero and then increase this contrast here in order to bring back the contrast in our scene. For example, something like this. And now if we switch, if we toggle it on and off, we can see that we, we get a better representation now of the scene or we get a more pleasing representation because now we don't get these uh, totally burned out parts in our picture, but we're basically not done yet. There are still a couple of steps that we can do to fine tune our pictures. So the next step could be to add like a lookup table. So I can add this option down here. And then um, if I want, I can load a lookup table in here. For example, I have this lookup table here and you can see it does some additional color adjustments here. For example, it plays with the saturation and lookup tables are just uh, files that you can find online, buy or download for free. Um, and then you can, uh, this, this is just additional modifications on top of your existing picture, right? So first step was to compress the dynamic range, but this way we're losing contrast. And now the step is to bring back the contrast without getting these overall ugly colors and without getting these uh, burnout parts. So the last step could be, for example, we add a curve adjustment on top. And then if we want to add some, uh, to have even stronger contrast, for example, then we could uh, modify the curve a little bit like this. And now if we go back to our original view, we can see we get a much nicer representation of our picture. So we had this one here before, which looked really unrealistic. And now if we go through here, we have something much more vivid, much more saturated, and that's just, and, and without these burned out parts. And that's, I mean, this one is all creative choices. So some people might think this one looks too saturated. Some people might want to even add more contrast. So that's all like creative choices. But in general, this picture here looks more pleasing to our eye than the purely linear picture that we had here in the beginning. So instead of using all of those three different adjustments in the latest version of V-Ray, there is an additional adjustment here, which is called Filmic Tone Map. And that's basically like a one-stop uh, adjustment that just does exactly the same thing that I did before with these three different nodes. You can just do everything in this one node. So that's something that's not available in earlier versions of V-Ray. Um, but yeah, so I think this one is also a nice option. You have different kind of adjustment types, which all look kind of different, but they basically do all the same kind of thing. They're compressing the dynamic range, they're adding back contrast, and they just make uh, like a nicer overall, uh, more pleasing representation of the picture. So this one here is the linear one again. That's what we had before. And then you can just choose these kind of different adjustments and play with these values. So I think for me, for example, uh, this one here, this MPAS looks good and it has also basically no adjustments in there, um, but you can also choose something where you, can, where you can have more modifications and then just take it from there. All right, so that concludes the first part of this tutorial, but don't leave just yet because I'm gonna give you a preview about what you're gonna learn in the second part. So if you want to be notified about this, make sure to subscribe and hit this little bell icon down there. And now I'm gonna show you what you're gonna learn in the next part. So the first thing that you will learn is how to optimize the scene even further. So at the moment, everything renders already quite fast, but there are certainly ways how you can optimize it. So for example, at the moment I have uh, here a perspective view so that I can move freely around my scene and everything always will be recalculated and that's probably how I oftentimes want it to be like but for example if I only stick to my camera view I have a different setup in here where it's much more optimized so that all the render power will be focused only on my shading dummy and not wasted on the floor which I don't want to modify anymore right but this setup then has for example a disadvantage that I can't move the camera around because everything is kind of baked and then I have a third setup which basically uh, helps in this regard so that 
I can move the camera freely around, but it renders much faster than the original setup that I had here. So you will learn those three different setups. Let's now switch back to the original one here. And then the other thing that you will learn is how to add additional lights so that you're not purely dependent on your HDRI, but you just get much more interesting highlights, highlights happening on your shading dummy. And then the last thing is how you can set up this scene as a startup scene in your 3ds Max so that whenever you start your 3ds Max, you're welcome with the scene and can start shading right away. So now you come into play, let me know down in the comment what you think about this kind of content, what is your way to do a studio setup and what kind of topics you would like to see covered in the future and subscribe to this channel if you want to be notified about any future updates. So I hope you enjoy this content and I hope to see you soon in the next video and take care.